Thank you, Jesus. We love you, God. We love you, mighty God. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you. We worship you. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, mighty God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We love you, God. We love you, Jesus. You are worthy. Hallelujah, mighty God. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy today. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you. We worship you. We adore you, mighty God. Hallelujah. Thank you, mighty God. You are holy. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. You are holy, mighty God. Hallelujah, mighty God. We love you, Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Good day today, my friend. Pastor Daniel Dagan, Hope Apostolic United Pentecostal Church. We'll be continuing today our Friday 1 p.m. broadcast. We call it Prophecy Live. The lessons come out of this book, The Unveiling. It's a book the Lord helped us put together some time ago. And we um, have that available. You can go to our website, hopeapostolicupc.org. Click on Donate, put in your name, address, and put the name of the book, The Unveiling. It's $30 plus $8 for U.S. shipping. Well, we want to get started, and um, we want to start out with prayer. We're going to be beginning a new series today, and we want to pray together right now. Can we do that? <clears throat> Lord God, I thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, your love, and your kindness. Touch us, Lord God, as we go into thy word, and God, be exalted, mighty God. Father, we pray that your spirit and your word would work in concert together in all things in Jesus' mighty name. We humbly pray. Amen, amen, amen. Well, we want to begin a new series today in this Friday session, 1 p.m. I teach on end time prophecy, eschatology related events. We study of the end time matters. And today we're going to begin a series, I don't know, probably a three-part series on the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. The judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I like to study and teach those two subjects together, though they're two different events, they're closely tied together and associated together. So... We'll begin today with the subject of the judgment seat of Christ. And then perhaps next week or the following week, we'll get into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we'll study them individually and then look at how they're tied together as well. Let me just make another comment here also. When we speak of the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb, that takes place after the rapture of the church. I've taught a lot about the rapture of the church. So once the rapture of the church takes place, it is, as we get into this, you'll see it, but it is reserved just for the bride of Christ, yea, the church, to be seated at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Though certainly there will be other believers present, the honored guest, the honored guest, is the bride. The honored guest is the bride, yea, the church. But it takes place, both of them. Judgment seat of Christ and the entirety of the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place after the rapture of the church. The judgment seat of Christ, I see that relatively taking place in a short amount of time. And the marriage supper of the Lamb, when we get into that later in this series, you'll see it is a process believe it begins at the rapture of the church, but the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's a process. When you study the Jewish wedding and you understand the process of that, the betrothal and such, you'll see that the marriage supper of the Lamb begins at the rapture of the church, but it's not culminated, culminated, completed until, yea, at the end of the seven years of tribulation. So one more opening comment I want to make. 
as we get into this first part of this study or this series, as we get into a study of the judgment seat of Christ. This is different than the great white throne judgment. In a lesson coming up, I will teach on the great white throne judgment. You read about that and you study that in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15, among other places. That is the judgment of the dead of all time, of the unbelievers of all time, of the unjust of all time. That is a resurrection unto death, yea, eternal death. Everybody from Cain forward, unredeemed, unbeliever, unsaved, the dead of all time will be judged at the great white throne judgment. That's essentially the last thing that happens on the biblical timeline before there being time no more and there's a new heaven and a new earth, new Jerusalem comes down and eternity begins. The last thing before that scene is the great white throne judgment. At the great white throne judgment, I'll teach a detailed lesson on this in the weeks to come. But at the great white throne judgment, no believers are judged there. It's not the great white throne judgment. It's not a judgment. Thumbs up, you're going to heaven. Thumbs down, you're going to Guiana, the lake of fire. No, it's not that at all. The great white throne judgment, every person that comes before God's throne at the great white throne judgment is absolutely going to be punished with eternal judgment, yea, in the lake of fire. It is where they ultimately receive the sentencing for the deeds or lack of, for the works or lack of. Everybody at the great white throne judgment that passes before the great white throne judgment of Jesus Christ is judged to spend eternity in hell with Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, a place that was created for Satan and yea, his fallen demons. So we'll study about the great white throne judgment in the weeks to come. I want to begin now with a definition of the judgment seat of Christ as we launch into this new series on the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. First studying the judgment seat of Christ. Can I have an amen if you're with me? Good to have different ones joining us. Sister Tony, Sister Hudson, other ones are joining us. God bless you. The judgment seat of Christ, it is from the Greek word bema, B-E-M-A. In the Greek law and courts, there was one seat, a judgment seat, a bema that was provided. And the judge would sit upon it. And yea, there in a seat of the one being judged, the person being accused would come and sit there. And it is in the midst of this we're given the New Testament word that designates the official seat of a judge, usually a Roman governor, also an emperor. You remember when you study from the days of Babylon, and you can take the image of Daniel 2, and the head of gold is Babylon, and then the Medo Persian Empire, and then the Grecian or Greek Empire, Alexander the Great, and then the ancient Roman Empire, of which Christianity ultimately destroys, and then from there the revived Roman Empire and the apostate church, the iron and the moral clay mixed together in the feet and the toes of that image of Daniel 2. Well, consider what preceded the time of the New Testament, yea, the Roman Empire, the ancient Roman Empire. What was that? It was the Grecian Empire, Alexander the Great. Much of what Rome stood upon came out of the Grecian Empire. And even some of our laws and jurisprudence and some of those things today, even in North America that we've derived from Great Britain, it's tied to elements of the Roman law and then from there even into the Grecian law. Some of our words take their root in the Grecian or Greek root of the original word that we use even in English today. So it's fascinating how the effects and the fingerprint of Greek was upon Rome. And then even we see the New Testament was written in the Greek language. And then the fingerprint of Greek and the Greek culture in Rome and the Roman culture is even today upon Great Britain and yea, upon America and American culture, judicial system and such. Can I have an amen? Well, this this word, the judgment seat or the bema, the judgment seat of Christ or the bema, 
You read about it, you read that actual statement, judgment seat, judgment seat, as it related to the different governors or ruling parties of the day. You read that word, judgment seat, in Matthew 27 and 19, as it relates to Pilate. You remember when they were going through the mockery of the court proceedings with Christ. You read the word judgment seat in Acts 18 and 12 as it relates to Gallio. You read of the word judgment seat in Acts 25 and 10 as it relates to Caesar when Paul comes before him. And there's many other references in the New Testament. I could give them to you, but multiple places in the New Testament writing where you read of the word judgment seat. And when you read it in the passages I just gave you, it relates to a governor or a reigning authority sitting in that judgment seat. Think about it in the court of law today. The seat of the judge, yea, the bench. That's the individual that's going to measure the facts and ultimately reward accordingly, punish or reward accordingly. And such it is in those passages. So this judgment seat, as it relates to the judgment seat of Christ. Let's look at that in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 down to verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 down to verse 11. Again, I emphasize as we open today, the judgment seat of Christ, it's not a judgment of heaven or hell. Every person that comes to the judgment seat of Christ, will be rewarded with eternal life. They will also be recognized for their works, if I can say that carefully, at the judgment seat of Christ, and they will be given certain honors and certain authorities, might I say, or standings or favor, will be bestowed upon them as a believer at the judgment seat of Christ. But every person at the judgment seat of Christ is saved and ultimately will be with Jesus for eternity. Every person at the great white throne judgment, it's a different scene. Revelations 20, 11 to 15, will be unsaved, will be judged as dead, and will spend eternity in hell. These are two different things. The judgment seat of Christ is for believers where they receive rewards. The great white throne judgment seen later Revelations 20, that is what unbelievers, the dead of all dispensations of all time, will be judged and they will ultimately receive the punishment or yea, the eternal reward, the judgment of hell, Guiana, to spend in the lake of fire with Satan. So we open up as we talk about the judgment seat of Christ, the rewarding of the saints of God as the rapture of the church has taken place now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 to 11. So the rapture takes place, and then we appear before the bema, or the judgment seat of Christ. Notice what it says. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all, can you type in all? We must all. So Paul, a member of the church, is writing to the church congregation in Corinth, to members and others that are in the church. He writes this under inspiration of God. All scriptures given by God, inspired by God. He writes it under inspiration of God. It's intended not just for the Corinthian saints, but it's intended to be circulated in the larger broad, of, broad body of Christ. But he says, we all, we must all, pretty definitive, we must all written by a Christian to Christians. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There's that statement. That's where we get this teaching and doctrine from. Appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, in their life, according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. So let me make several statements here in reference to 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11. He's speaking of the good things that you've done for God in this life, the good things that you've done for God in 
this life. Okay, Jude, I won't go there. You can reference it in your own notes. Jude, the book of Jude, the end of the New Testament. Jude, verse 22 to 24. There's only one chapter. Jude 22 to 24 speaks of knowing God's coming judgment. We compel people to come to God. Some with love and kindness, others with fear pulling from the flames. He's dealing with that a little bit in that passage of 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11. But he says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone to receive the things they've done in his body. Okay, hold your place there in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11. And I want to look at 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Let me give you a moment to get there. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Give me an amen online when you have it. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Hold your place in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11. We just read that Paul, a Christian, is writing to the church, other Christians, and he says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Then he goes on to speak of whether it be good things that we receive or bad. We don't receive all that potentially we could have received, okay? Hold on to that, and let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 to 15. Again, the same guy, Paul, right into the same church congregation in Corinth. He says, For we are labors together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, yea, the bride, bridegroom. Ye are God's building according to the grace which is given unto me. As a wise builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Do you hear the language? So Paul lays the foundation as a godly teacher, but then he tells every man, every Christian in Corinth, to give heed to how you build thereon. So everybody's given the same opportunity in the kingdom. Everybody's given the same opportunity as we teach from 1 Corinthians 3, 9 to 15. And we talk about receiving rewards as Christians when we pass before the judgment seat of Christ. Every believer is given the same opportunity to pray, to fast, to do good things for God, to reach out to souls. That is what Paul is speaking of in 1 Corinthians 3, 9 to 15. I have laid the foundation and another build it thereupon. But let every man take heed how he build it thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Hear the language. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, man's works shall be made manifest. Again, that takes place at the judgment seat of Christ. The old adage, only what you've done for God will last. Only what you do for God's kingdom will be rewarded. Okay, so I may go and, and, and I'm not against fishing. I'm not against playing golf. I'm not against exercising and riding your bike. God bless you. Take care of your temple. Have time away. Refresh yourself. But when I do those types of things, especially hobbies, and I just fill up my schedule with things that I want to do, they may not be sinful. Okay, so I may not be punished for that in terms of sin. None of those things I mentioned, golf and fishing and things, none of that's sinful. Keep it in proper perspective. It's not sinful. It's just stuff that we like to do. Amen. But Am I going to receive a great spiritual reward because of how many fish are caught? No. Am I going to receive a great spiritual reward because of how many miles I rode on my bike? No. It may be something I enjoy to do, and God allows me to have those moments of leisure and relaxation. But what he's speaking about is only what you've done for God is going to last, and yea, is going to be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. They that convert many to righteousness, here it is, shall shine as a firmament of heaven, Daniel 12. I continue to read 1 Corinthians 3, 9 to 15. For the day shall declare it. What day is going to declare our works? That is the day of which we appear before the judgment seat of Christ, where all believers will appear and be judged or rewarded, shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. That fire is a picture 
of ultimately judgment. It's not hell, the lake of fire, but it's ultimately the judgment of God's refining fire to see if something will stand, to see if something will stand when it is really, really measured by God's refining fire. So the fire shall try every man's work, what sort it is. Catch this last statement. Please catch it. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Can you type in loss? He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Can you say that out loud? Saved. Yet so as by fire. So it speaks to that if my time as a Christian is given to my hobbies and leisures, they're not sinful. I'm not doing sinful things. I'm not being unfaithful, but I'm not maximizing every moment for the kingdom like I could, like I really could. Okay, <clears throat> when I pass before the judgment seat of Christ, then the time that I invested in whatever, swimming laps in the swimming pool, riding a bike, fishing, going shopping, whatever you do in your leisure time, that's not sinful. I'm not going to be judged for that and punished for that, but I'm not going to really receive a spiritual reward for how many laps I swim in the swimming pool, okay? So that's what it says, that, that man will suffer loss. Well, if I can take some of the time, let's say I give 15 hours a week to playing golf, well, if I can maybe give two hours a week to golf and maybe maybe 13 hours a week to teaching Bible studies and to prayer and to personal Bible devotion, then is that going to benefit me spiritually when I pass before the judgment seat of Christ and I receive my rewards, my spiritual rewards and places and positions of honor from Christ? Certainly it will because only what you do for Christ will last. Does that make sense? Can I have an amen if you're with me? I know I've jumped into this both both barrels smoking right out of the gates. We continue now talking about the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Can you give me an amen right now if you're with the preacher? We continue talking about the judgment seat of Christ. It says in Romans chapter 14, verse 10 down to 12. Verse 10 down to 12, Romans 14. Why doest thou judge thy brother? Or why doest thou set it not thy brother? For we shall, here it is, here it is, all stand. Again, the same guy, Paul, Brother Gilbert, I love you, buddy. The same guy, Paul, is writing to Christians, now the mixed congregation in Rome, Jew and Gentile. And as he writes to them in Romans chapter 14, 10 to 12, Sister Luz, great to have you with us. Sister Diane, Sister Tonin, great to have all you folks with us. And as Paul writes, we're teaching today on the judgment seat of Christ. Every believer, 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 saved believer will pass before the judgment seat of Christ to receive their eternal favor, rewards, honoring. Okay? Every unbeliever passes at the end of the Bible, Revelations 20, 11 to 15, before the judgment, I'm sorry, before the great white throne judgment, Revelations 20, 11 to 15. Do you see the distinction? Believers pass before the judgment seat of Christ are rewarded. Every unbeliever, the dead, the unsaved of all time, pass before the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20. 20, 11 to 15. Continuing today talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Romans chapter 14, verse 10 to 12. Why doest thou judge thy brother? He's writing to the church. Why doest thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all, all, all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. A Christian speaking to other Christians and says, we all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself unto God. So every one of us will give an account. In other words, we may not 
stand before the judgment seat of Christ as believers and have a day planner and have to give an answer for every second, every moment of every day. No, I don't think that's going to happen. But when it speaks of us giving account of ourselves to God, we're ultimately at that point going to answer by standing before the judgment seat of Christ for what we've done with our talents, what we've done with our time, what we've done with our treasures. And again, you know, this is for believers. This is for believers. I do agree that you can, you can be so unfaithful and so derelict and so slowful and so lethargic, lukewarm, that you're going to enter into a place of sin and be judged as a sinner. What I'm speaking of is not that, but there's people that have an opportunity to do great things for God, and they don't push themselves to that level. Well, they're certainly saved. Yes, they are. And they have done some good things for God, and they will be rewarded for that on the account of those things that they've done. Not a reward of heaven or hell, no. If you come to the judgment seat of Christ, you are automatically saved at that point. You're already saved. You would have fulfilled all requirements in your life to be saved in your dispensation, to make it to the judgment seat of Christ. But at the judgment seat of Christ, you receive your reward. You give an account for your actions and your time, what you've done for Christ at that point. What you've done for Christ at that point. Can I have an amen? Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let's continue moving. Here in 2 John chapter 1, verse 8. 2 John chapter 1, verse 8. 2 John chapter 1, verse 8. It reads, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Do you see the language? 2 John Chapter 1, verse 8. Look to yourself. So examine yourself. Examine yourself and make sure that you are uh, making your calling and election sure. Calling and election sure. So we need to maximize what we're doing for God. Okay, I don't, I don't want to, if I have the ability to do great things for God, I don't want to be satisfied just doing good things for God. You understand? I'm not speaking of trying yourself by another person. I'm speaking of you individually maximizing what God has called you to do. It's what he deals with in 2 John verse 8. Look to yourself, not without within. Look to yourself that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward, a full reward. Okay, we continue teaching here now. Next, next verse I want to look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. He's again a Christian writing to other Christians. Uh, it's in the place of the epistles writing to the church. And, and he says, he reminds them that God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love. That is pointing towards the ultimate spiritual favor and reward that believers will receive when they come to the judgment seat of Christ tied to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Tied to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we continue, we continue. Um, here in Revelation chapter 3, Verse 11, Revelations 3, verse 11. It's a reference here to the crown. I'll get more into the discussion of the crowns and the passages that deals with the crowns and what they represent. Is it a literal crown of gold, silver, jewels, or what is it? We'll talk about that. It's coming up in a moment. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, as we talk about the judgment seat of Christ where the saints will be rewarded. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. That no man take thy crown. So he's speaking of that we need to hold on to the ground that we have made. We need to hold on to our eternal reward, 
the ultimate favor, the honoring, the rewarding, the recognition that God is going to bestow upon us at the judgment seat of Christ, we need to hold on to that, that no man would take it. I don't want to allow somebody that's contented here in God to somehow diminish my passion and diminish my zeal and diminish my desire to work for God. I say that very carefully and very humbly. I want to hold on to everything that God's called me to do. I want to go after it. I want to reach for it. And I want to come to realize, I say humbly in eternity, and hear the words that I have been faithful in all that God has put me over. I have done all that God has called me to do. Here's another reference to the crowns. Revelation chapter 4, verse 4. This is written towards the church prior to the tribulation passages. That begins in Revelation 6. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats, yea, four and twenty elders. Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had their heads on their heads crowns of gold. They were taken up, and then they are seen there with the crowns of gold. So they are honored, the four and twenty elders. I teach a separate lesson on that, but that's the twelve ultimate heads of the tribes of Israel as recognized recognized in Acts 1 and yea, in the book of Revelation, the sealing of the 12 tribes, 144,000. So that's 12 of the elders that are mentioned in the 4 and 20, and the other 12 are the apostles, Acts 1 into Acts 2. So that's the 4 and 20 elders. That's the 4 and 20 elders. Okay, we continue teaching here now. The question comes up when you think about the judgment seat of Christ and how the, the saints of God are going to pass before the judgment seat of Christ and be honored and be rewarded and even, as it says, have crowns bestowed upon them. The question has, has come up, what, what does this mean exactly? Is this a crown of gold and of silver, of jewels and precious things of that nature? It, it could be perhaps, it could be perhaps, but I don't really view it that way. Me, personally, in my study, I don't view it that way. I'm going to offer you several thoughts on why I do not view it that way. If you see it differently, so be it. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to fall out with you over that. But I don't view it that way. When we speak of the judgment seat of Christ, again, others have come on since we started teaching. The judgment seat of Christ is where the believers, the saints of God, as a raptured, they pass before that judgment seat of Christ and they receive those rewards, those honors. It's spoken about as crowns and different honors and different positions and things of that nature in multiple passages. Well, that, that's bestowed upon them at the judgment seat of Christ. Every saint that makes it to the judgment seat of Christ is absolutely saved. They're honored at that time. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, these crowns. Um, I remember in teaching this lesson one time to the church I'm on at the pastor when we're still in an old building in Inglewood. I, I, I taught what I'm about to teach right now and how these crowns are not a literal crown of gold, silver that tarnishes, that fades away, that's corruptible, but it's more rather a spiritual crown that fadeth not away. And man, when I got done teaching that, I had one of the precious women in the church. I could say a lot about it, I'm not. But she came up to me. She was absolutely heartbroken. She was actually a woman that kind of fell out with me a couple of times and I taught on holiness and gold and jewelry and all of that. But she came up to me. She was absolutely heart, a great woman, but she was heartbroken because she envisioned in heaven that she was going to have one, two, three, four, five crowns stacked on top of each other. And they were going to be of some, um, you know, astronomical value of gold and silver and precious stones. That's not what it's speaking about. That's not what it's speaking about. I believe these crowns that are referenced, and there's five crowns that are referenced, okay? I'll give you the chapters and verses in a moment. But these different crowns that are references are not speaking of a tangible crown that tarnishes, that is physical material. I'll give you chapter and verse in a moment. But they're not a literal crown, but more rather they're speaking to positions of honor, authority, and service that God is going to bestow upon believers, yea, as we go into the millennium, 
the thousand year reign of Christ upon the earth as we have as a rapture church, celestial bodies, heavenly spiritual bodies, and then even beyond the millennium into New Jerusalem. I believe it's an honor, a favor, a, a type of authority that's going to be bestowed upon the believers during that time. I'll give you some uh, chapters and verses that qualifies that. One place, I'm not going to go there, but one place that you can go to and really dig it out. I'm just giving you a surface cursory lesson today on the judgment seat of Christ. But one place is Luke 19, 11 to 27. It deals with the parable of the pounds, as it's called there. Luke 19, 11 to 27. And as you get into that, it, it begins to deal with some of the positions of honor or favoring that God's going to bestow upon different ones based upon what they've done as a believer in this life and how that's going to be rewarded and honored for them in the life to come. Great to have others joining us. Uh, Brother and Sister White Barra, Sister Masani, and Sister Alexis, it's great to have you joining us now. So again, these crowns that are going to be bestowed upon believers as a reward as we come to the judgment seat of Christ. And I've given you chapter and verses earlier for the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 to 15, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11, Romans 14, 10 through 12. All of that speaks of the judgment seat of Christ. Now, in relationship to the crowns, can you turn in your Bibles? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. I just made a statement. I don't want to upset you. I don't want to mess with your theology or anything you've been taught. But the crowns are not. The crowns that we will be given that that will be granted unto believers here at the judgment seat of Christ, they're not a tangible crown that tarnishes of, yea, gold, silver, and materials of this earth, okay? It's not. Here's the qualifying verses. 1 Corinthians 9, 25. Let me go back to 24. Can you give me an amen when you have it? 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Give me a moment to get some water. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24. Hallelujah. Can somebody give me an amen here? Thank you, Jesus. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Paul writing to the church, and much of what I've already given you on the judgment seat was directed to the church of Corinth. Paul writing to the church, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race all but one receiveth the prize. One receiveth the prize. Okay? What prize is he speaking of? A trophy. I have them in the, in the attic. Trophies that I received when I was younger playing sports in grade school and otherwise. So in the context of it, he's speaking of that natural, tangible trophy. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things, now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Can you say mastery? So what I was speaking of earlier in, in, in being a great steward of your time and not playing golf 15 hours a week, but maybe playing two hours a week and using 13 hours for Bible study and for other things. That's a picture of somebody that is striving for mastery, Okay. I'm not dealing with unfaithful and faithful because that gets into being controlled by sin and, and not being controlled by sin. I'm not dealing with that, okay? When you speak of the judgment seat of Christ and the rewards or the honoring that's going to be bestowed upon believers, it's not, well, he was faithful, let me bless him. He was unfaithful, come on into heaven. You're unfaithful, come on in, but I'm not going to give you the same honor or the same crown that I give the other one. That's not what it's dealing with unfaithful, being unfaithful, not being a good steward, that puts you in a position of judgment, puts you in a position of judgment, yea, sin. But but even as a faithful believer, there's certainly different dimensions of faithfulness. If you come to church every service on time, you're faithful. You're faithful to church. I think you get by with that. But then there's other people that come to church early and stay late. There's other people that are in the prayer meeting the moment the door opens up and they're the last ones to leave the altar. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Some people faithfully worship every Sunday, but then there's other people that faithfully go above and beyond, above and beyond in their worship every Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday, and yay, day by day in their personal life. 
That's what he's dealing with. Are you with me now? Do you feel this? Is it opening up to you? So he that striveth, that's it, striving for mastery, is temperate. There it is. It's all coming together. Temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we incorruptible. So the corruptible crown, that's a tangible crown. That's that one that you can physically touch, has matter. It's something tangible. You can touch it. But, but we're doing this for an incorruptible crown. Okay, for the Bible interpretation that we hold to be accurate, the Bible cannot contradict the Bible. Everything has to fit together line upon line. So you can take the misnomer that you're going to get to heaven and have some giant crown like Alexander the Great in the Grecian Empire had or like Herod had or whatever. You're not going to have some giant crown of gold and silver and all these jewels and all this. You're not going to have that. I'm not going to have that. Okay, I don't mean to bust your theological bubble, but it doesn't hold up to the examination of the scriptures on the same subject of the crown. We continue an incorruptible crown. Verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth against the air, but then it gets into, and, and that's a lesson for another day. Let's go on the subject of the crown that is incorruptible, that fadeth not away. Let's go towards the end of the Bible. Can you go with me? First Peter, first Peter chapter five, first Peter chapter five, in verse 4, notice what it says here in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4. So here's a second witness. 1 Peter 5 verse 4. When the chief shepherd shall appear. So what is that? That's speaking to the rapture of the church. The chief shepherd shall appear where? In the sky. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. The dead in Christ rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Okay, so when Jesus, the chief shepherd, appears, pastors are considered to be the under shepherd, under shepherd. But when the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, appears, then the rapture takes place. Well, at, at the time of the rapture, I don't know if it's seconds later, minutes later, hour, I don't have a clue. But, but tied to the scene of the rapture of the church, the judgment seat of Christ, uh, takes place, that scene. And the Bible doesn't tell us how much time elapses between the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ. I view them biblically that they're tied together. Language here indicates that it's tied together. But when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory. Here it is, that fadeth not away. So we've seen it already, two witnesses, two witnesses in scripture that, that were going and we're doing the things for God. We're striving for mastery. We're trying to be temperate, trying to control our time, trying to control our life. Yes, to stay saved, but then also to maximize what we do for God in this life as to be favored and honored in a great way in the life to come. And we do it not for tangible things. If It doesn't even make sense. If I was doing this somehow to get gold and silver, how would that really align with the fact that heaven is a, a non-tangible celestial spiritual place. I don't even see that lining up with that truth. First Corinthians 15 speaks of um, that there's no flesh and blood in heaven. There's, there's not any flesh and blood in heaven. So it's a spiritual place. And how would it look for me floating around in heaven with the crown? with a gold and silver crown. It's not going to work, friend of mine. It doesn't line up to the scriptures. So it's a crown that faded not. It's a crown that's not that's not corruptible. It's incorruptible or immortal. Immortal. So um, that's, that's my biblical thought on it. Let me just make a couple other comments here. Um, when you, when you look at, when you look at the passages that specifically mentions the different crowns, okay? When you look at those passages, I'm not going to read through every one of them. I'll give them to you now. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 to 27 speaks of an eternal crown. Hear the language. Just hear the language. Go back and watch the video. Write the verses down later. Okay, 1 Corinthians 9, 25 to 27 speaks of an eternal, eternal crown. 
2 Timothy 4.8 speaks of a crown of righteousness. James 1.12 speaks of a crown of life. 1 Peter 5.2 to verse 4 speaks of a crown of glory. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20 speaks of a crown of rejoicing. Well, when you consider the word crown in those passages, uh, it's defined by Strong's Concordance of the Bible to mean a mark of royalty, an exalted, honored rank. So that settles it right there that it's not a crown of gold, silver, and precious jewels and all of that, that settles it. Okay, beyond that, listen to the words as a crown is described. It doesn't say crown of gold. It doesn't say crown of silver. It doesn't say tangible crown. It doesn't say crown that you can touch. It doesn't say crown of diamonds, okay? I realize when you talk about the foundations of heaven and the gates of heaven, there's a description given that makes you think it's something physical you can touch. It's a spiritual place, friend of mine. The description is given as a picture, almost as an allegory when you read about the foundations of heaven, when you read about the streets of gold as pure glass. The, the very comparison as pure glass lets us know it's given that we can see it through a simple mind, a simple um, finite mind really struggles to comprehend the infinite God that we serve in his descriptions of, of heaven, okay, and what eternity is going to be like. So many of those descriptions, it's given so we can understand it. Yes, it's going to be an absolutely glorious place, okay, but all the things that we think of when we think of value in this life where they have a million dollar house and, and perhaps they have a big gold Rolodex and they have a nice Mercedes and they have a lot of gold and silver and money. Well, perhaps we'll think about that person as being blessed if they have those things. I don't. But perhaps some people view that person that has those tangible things as being blessed. Do you really understand what makes heaven heaven? It's not any thought that there's a pile of gold there. It's not any thought that there's precious gems and stones there. It's not any thought that there's a lot of silver or money piled up there. What makes heaven, heaven is this. Satan is gone forever. Your carnal nature is gone forever. Sin is gone forever. Tears are not there. Hurt is not there. Pain is not there. Sin is not there. Temptation is not there. The Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, Mother Babylon, the apostate spirit is not there. Jesus is the center of the city, the light of the city, the temple of the city, and there's nothing standing between you and him. There's no sin, there's no flesh, there's no devil, there's no temptation, there's no bills, there's no job, there's nothing. That's what makes heaven, heaven, the unabated, unhindered access we have to Jesus continually, perpetually in his presence with no tears, with no sadness, without any damnable flesh to hinder us, make us tired and overwhelm us. Yes, yes, by description, it's a glorious place. Yes, I agree, but it's not gold that makes it glorious. It's not silver and all of these things. Are you with me? Can I get some help? Can the preacher get an amen? So when you talk about the crowns, Okay, the words that are used to describe the crowns, eternal, crown of eternal significance, eternal crown, crown of righteousness, righteousness, crown of life, life, crown of glory, glory, crown of rejoicing, rejoicing. I don't know about you. I got a pretty good imagination. I have trouble figuring out how I'm going to make a crown out of rejoicing. How's that going to weave together to make something I can put on my head? a crown of glory. I can't see that making some type of thing that I put on my head, make a crown out of glory. All these words by purpose and by intent are something that are intangible. These are things that are intangible. In other words, God's going to give you a crown, an eternal crown. In other words, an eternal favor is going to be upon you. From the judgment seat forward, you will be crowned. You will be honored. Have you ever heard that that man married a woman and his wife it is, is his crown in honor. 
Have you ever heard references of kids where it said that they're really a crowning glory to their parents? Does that mean that they sit on top of their parents' head as a crown would sit on a king's head? No. It means that they have bestowed that honor upon their parents. That's what it's dealing with here, friend. So, eternal crown speaks of uh, uh, an honoring that's bestowed upon the believer. Yea, an eternal honor. A crown of righteousness. Again, your righteousness is celebrated. You're honored for that and so forth and so forth. I think you understand it. I think you understand it. Can I have an amen? Can I have an amen here? So um, let me just make a few other comments here. Luke 13 and 29. Luke 13 and 29. Can you go there with me? Luke 13 and verse 29. Hallelujah. Feel the Holy Ghost here today. We talk a little bit more about the rewarding of the saints. After the rapture, the saints go to the judgment seat of Christ. And then by the end of the seven years of tribulation, Daniel's 70th week, the marriage supper of the Lamb has concluded. It's been completed. We'll get next week perhaps, but certainly during this series, the next three or four weeks, as we complete a discussion of the judgment seat of Christ, we'll get into a lengthy discussion of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a process. The marriage supper of the Lamb, we hear the word marriage many times in North America, and we think about a three-hour ceremony and a reception on a Saturday afternoon in late May. But that's not what the Jewish ceremony was. That's not the process that led up to the culmination and coming together in the Jewish wedding. It was a lengthy process, and we'll get into that as we move through this series. Um, other guests will be present at the marriage supper of the Lamb, but only the bride is married to the bridegroom. Only the bride, yea, the church, will be seated at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Consider Luke 13, verse 29. Luke 13, verse 29. I think this is a reference, and you can get deep into this, but let me just read this verse. Luke 13, 29. And they shall come from the east and from the west, <clears throat> from the north and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. So that points to what is going to take place during the marriage supper of the Lamb. God collects through the rapture. God collects together the saints of God. Jump down to chapter 14, same book. St. Luke chapter 14, verse 12 down to verse 15. Verse 12 down to verse 15. Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and make a recompense be made for thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. Or require repayment of thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Did you catch that last statement? Thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Okay. I want to focus in on that. We'll get deeper into the marriage supper in the weeks to come. Remember the last couple of weeks we taught on the first resurrection. And in that teaching we taught on Many places in the Old Testament and New, it speaks of a resurrection of the just and a resurrection of the unjust. A resurrection to life and a resurrection to death. A resurrection to reward and a resurrection to punishment. Well, as we think about believers of all time, certainly all of them fall into the category of the resurrection of believers, of the just, a resurrection to reward a resurrection to life. Well, in lieu of that, when we think about the judgment seat of Christ, the church, yea, part of, part of the eternal family of God will be resurrected at the rapture unto a resurrection of life. And as we come to the judgment seat of Christ, we will, yea, be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Recompense in that verse means to be repaid. Or it can also be rendered as, as rewarded. And who's going to do the rewarding? <clears throat> the judgment seat of Christ. 
multiple places, it identifies Christ as a righteous judge. 2 Timothy 4.1. And you see also in 2 Timothy 4.8, uh, Paul speaks that the righteous judge will give a crown of righteous honor unto all of those on that day that love his appearing. So Jesus is the one that sits on the judgment seat of Christ. As there was a judgment seat in Matthew 27 and 19 that Pilate set upon where ultimately judgment was made against the Christ. As there was a judgment seat in Acts 18 and 12 that Gallio set upon. As there was a judgment seat in Acts 25 and 10 that Caesar set upon and, and made judgment against Paul. Yea, Jesus, Jesus, the only righteous judge, 2 Timothy 4, 1, 2 Timothy 4, 8, will sit at the judgment seat of Christ and will make judgment, yea, will reward and will honor and bestow favor, recognition, status upon the believers, yea, the saints of God after the rapture of the church. He will coincidentally, that one, that one Jesus Christ will also be, he's the only one righteous enough, he's the only one pure enough, yea, he's a creator, he's a savior, he will also be the one that sits upon the one throne, Revelation 4-2, as lion and lamb you read about throughout the book of Revelation, he will be the name of the one, he is the one named in Revelation chapter 19 into 20, that sits upon that throne and that will reign upon the throne of yea, the great white throne judgment where the dead and unbelievers of all times, of all dispensations will be judged in Revelations 20, 11 to 15. So every man will be judged out of what they have done in this life. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. First Peter chapter one. Can you go there with me as you turn the corner today? First Peter chapter one and verse 17. First Peter chapter one and verse 17. Notice what it says. First Peter 1 17. So, so there's three books that ultimately determine the fate of all of mankind. The Bible. If you obey or don't obey it, that's number one. The words that he has spoken is we're going to judge us in the last days. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall stand forever, Jesus said. The Bible is going to judge us, okay? Not the words of people, organizations, or denominations. Number two, the Lamb's Book of Life. The book that records the names of all of those that are saved, that are saved. All those that will rise in the resurrection of the just, different phases of it, taught on that the last few weeks. All those that will rise in the resurrection of life, a resurrection to be rewarded, their names will be written in the book of life spoken about in both covenants okay and third the book that bears your deeds the book that has your name on it my book that has my name on it those three books okay i don't necessarily see three books on a great table that's going to be opened up to a particular page when everybody passes every believer passes before the judgment seat and you'll be rewarded in a good way out of that but those books will stand in judgment testify against witness to all every believer as we come before the judgment seat of Christ. Likewise, they will stand in judgment against the dead and every unbeliever that comes before the great white throne judgment at the end of time in Revelations 20. Consider what it says. Consider what it says. Can you go with me? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. If you call on the Father, who without respect to person, Judge it according to every man's work. Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. So he will judge every man according to their works. And certainly Acts 2, 38, salvation is tied to that. There's other references. I'm not going to give them all to you. Jeremiah 17 and 10. Ecclesiastes 3, 17. There's many, many other references here I could give you. You continue to read about throughout the New Testament many times of the resurrection or the rewarding of the just, and yea, the punishment, the final pronouncement, or sentencing upon the unjust in these two different scenes. The judgment seat of Christ, the rewarding of saints, 
the great white throne judgment, the pronouncing of eternal judgment, damnation upon the dead or the unsaved of all time. You read that throughout Colossians 3, 24, 25, Hebrews 9, 27, Revelations 22 and 12. You see it there as well. Let me make some closing comments here to finish up the lesson on the judgment seat of Christ as we prepare next week, next Friday, 1 p.m., the study on the marriage supper of the Lamb, the great honor that is given to the bride of Christ, yea, so that we can be tied together, come together with the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, and be celebrated, sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That, that's one of the points that clearly, clearly marks the church as not going through the seven years of tribulation, being raptured before that. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 15. We've talked about that earlier. Go back and study that. Again, hear what it says in 1 Corinthians 4 and 5. 1 Corinthians 4 and 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. That's key. Before the time. Until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. So believers will be rewarded some with a greater honoring than others. Think about the parable of the talents, okay? But God is going to judge that. Don't judge it before the time. Let God judge it. He's the only righteous judge at the judgment seat at the Bema after the rapture of the church going into as part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. A great picture of, of this is seen in this last passage, I want to reference Matthew chapter 25. It's really verse 1 down to verse 30, but I'm just going to just hasten, hasten, hasten. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 down to verse 10. I'll paraphrase verse 1 through 9. Matthew 25, verse 1 through 9. The parable of the ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. Okay, all of them slept. The bridegroom, pitch of Jesus Christ, comes for the bride, pitch of the church, at midnight, at the lateness of the hour. You think about Chicago's university's doomsday clock. You could Google it right now. Chicago University has a doomsday clock. And midnight, according to their doomsday clock, represents Armageddon, represents the end of what we understand as civilization. And they say the latest report I seen just a few weeks ago is, according to their doomsday clock, and they tie it to global population, global warming, global catastrophic events, uh, food shortages, um, horrific natural disasters and things of that sort. That's what they tie this clock to. And they say there's 100 seconds, according to the doomsday clock, to the meltdown of civilization as we know it, and yay, Armageddon. Well, the midnight hour is how they mark the 100 second point, yea, the end of the doomsday clock. Well, according to Matthew 25, at midnight the bridegroom cometh. At midnight the bridegroom cometh, and five of the virgins, yea, the bride was prepared and ready, had oil to pitch of the Holy Ghost, staying renewed in the spirit, staying prayed up, staying refreshed, keeping your, your spirit clean and pure, your garments clean without blemish and without mark. But notice what it says in lieu of, in lieu of the rapture of the church, the judgment seat of Christ, and this marriage supper of the Lamb, the process, yea, this experience of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Notice what it says in Matthew 25, 10. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready, so the five foolish went to go buy oil, and during that time, the midnight hour, the bridegroom picture, Jesus came, and they that were ready, that's a picture of the bride, the church, went in with him to the marriage. So that happens immediately. He comes, they go in, they go in immediately to the marriage, immediately to the marriage, and, and it begins, and what happens? The door is shut. The door is shut. So the bride goes in, the bride goes in, and there at the marriage, honored as a seated guest, is the church, is the church. So in lieu of that passage, we'll pick up right there next Friday, one o'clock, and we'll go deep into a discussion of that, the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
what a great celebration is going to be. We're going to be with Jesus celebrating the marriage supper of the Lamb, the church, the bride, the bridegroom, as the world suffers through the horrors of the wrath of the Lamb, seven years of tribulation, seven years of tribulation, Daniel's 70th week. And then we'll all come together at Armageddon and then we'll go into the millennium, the celebration of Jesus in the millennium temple for a thousand years in Jerusalem on earth, on earth. And then the great white throne judgment, New Jerusalem time no more, heaven, and we'll be with him with the saints of all time. We'll talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb next week. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me, pastordagan at gmail.com. If you attend an apostolic church preaching the whole counsel of God, please check with your pastor before you email me. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy. Father, thank you for allowing us to be together, study that word together. Help us all, God, to make a calling and election short. Help us, Lord God, to be ready to meet you in that great, great day. We thank you, mighty God, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Please pray for us. We covered your prayers. We're praying for you. Share these broadcasts. Go to hopeapostoliqpc.org. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel on that website, top left corner. You can connect to several other lessons we have on that website. And if you have any loved ones in Southwest Florida, please direct them to us. God bless you. We love you. Have a great day. Bye now.